Welcome back to the Overmatch Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin. And today I'm interviewing Ushin Feeney, who is the host and writer for the Troubles podcast about the violence and bloodshed in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and Britain. That's that those are your words at the at the start of the podcast. Yeah, Ushin, welcome, right welcome, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Your your voice sounds very familiar. I have uh I have recommended somebody recommended your podcast to me because I did a post about Northern Ireland and um, I have recommended it a bunch of times and people have reached out and going, oh, my God, it's freaking great. And when I posted this morning on Instagram, I said I was going to be interviewing you. People were like, um, they, 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 they've gotten so much from it because it's not bias one way or the other. It's just the facts. It's it's bite size portions. <laughs> and it, it's it's this sounds terrible, but it's dumbed down to make it understandable because it's such a complex conflict that went on for decades and, and it cost thousands and thousands of lives. And look, I grew up there and I find it hard to freaking understand sometimes. Right. Uh, yeah. Because I think there's just so many different uh, kind of factors involved and so many different um organizations and, and political organizations and and, and um, paramilitary organizations it, it was uh, it's very complex so you, you did a great job uh, oh, thank you I appreciate that yeah it's, <laughs> it's it's a tough one um it's a lot of people just want to put it down to Catholic versus Protestant but um it's so much more than just two sides uh, mm. it's multiple organizations multiple goals so much fracture fracturing and infighting and everything. Um, and yeah, so my my constant strive is to be impartial and unbiased, um, but that can be very difficult to do. Um, so, you know, not everybody thinks it's unbiased, but that's what I strive to do oh, every really? single time I write it. Yeah, I, yeah. I get some feedback all the time. Of course, look, if, if a podcast gets big, you will always get feedback. So I got accused mm -hmm. of bias on both sides. So I think that's a good sign. Wow. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, yeah, they're both yeah. coming at you. I think it's, you know. Where you sit is where you stand, right? And people get so yeah. entrenched in that, that the fact that, you know, there's a quote from Abraham Lincoln about the Civil War. And I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's a great quote. It said he said that in great conflict, both sides claim to be acting uh, with the will of God. Um, he said both may be, but one side, both sides may be, but one side must be wrong. Right. Um, if both sides say that they're 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 working with the, the the will of God, they can't both be right. Basically, is what yeah. he was saying, and they're probably both wrong. And there was horrific violence from all sides in that conflict. Yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. But I I think your timing is great because I I think more information is coming out now than it, it would have been tough to source some of this stuff. Uh, you know, even a decade ago. So um, let, let's get, let's get some context right here. Where, where did you grow up? So, yeah, I grew up in County Meath. Um, so like I said, right beside close to Dublin for anyone who's not from from the area. Um, and then I basically I did media in college um, and then I went off to Chicago for a year. Then I came back and I worked for a bank. I hated that so much. I fled to South Korea for two years. Um, <laughs> and that's that's how I ended up. I kind of ended up in um and tourism i guess over there but it was really cool i was very close to the north korean border so we could um oh okay explore all of the like the the dugouts and everything the town i lived in was set up for an invasion basically and uh, no one was yeah. afraid of one but it was very cool to just explore pillboxes and all that sort of stuff yeah um yeah so then, then i came home i found a job with the daily star um and i became like kind of like a clickbait journalist which i hated and i was just really bad at to be honest mm -hmm. so uh, i left that then i geez well, then i became a hiking guide so i worked in the north of italy for a while and over in iceland um, and all around, that was around the time I said to myself, okay, I've been listening to podcasts for 10 years now. What would be a good topic? What would be something interesting to, to put out to the world? Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd had a couple of stints in Northern Ireland just visiting friends. And, you know, like one friend, we were just walking around and I was like, oh, geez, what's that like massive metal cage? And she's like, oh, that's a that's a police station. And I was mm. like, they, they still look like that? She's like, oh, yeah, there's petrol bombs attacks every couple of weeks. I was like, what? Like, this, this, is, this, this, this is when the last couple, I thought they, they took down all those big fortified locations, no? They they took down the major ones, but most mm. police stations in rural towns and stuff are still very, not heavily fortified, but there's big massive walls and fences. Um, mm. And then just, just the way she talked to me and just the way some other people talked to me, and I was like, you know, we went up to visit a friend in Monaghan and we were going to go on the booze. We we're going to buy a load of beer. And so we we're going to cross over the border and get beers and bring them over because they're cheaper. 10 minute drive. Mm -hmm. 
And his mom was like, oh, now, guys, be very careful with that car. And I was like, what? I was like, this thing is not a, but it's it's something that's built into the, um, I think, the psyche of a lot of people, even though there's not mm-hmm. much of a fear of violence. Like, so mm-hmm. this person initially that I went to, I was working with her for three days. We were working for the Northern Irish Tourist Board. And uh, she was staying, with, I'd pick her up and we were going to stay together for three days in different places and take pictures and all this stuff. And her mother was like, you're going away with Asheen Feeney. And her mother was terrified because someone so Irish was going to be spending time with her daughter. Her mother mm. had this real fear because she was obviously of, of the Protestant uh, background, mm-hmm. or, you know, unionist. So yeah. it was just a lot of this sort of stuff kind of came at me. And I was like, there's obviously a lot going on. And I, as an Irish person in my early 30s, um, I don't know it and I don't understand it. There's no way anyone else in the world, if an Irish person can't understand this period, how, how the heck can anyone from the U.S.? get into mm. this and then i started looking up sources and started looking up things online there is an abundance of documentaries all over the place from years ago there's thousands of books written but there was no real concise core collection of everything and i kind of felt that you know i used to love the irish history podcast it's probably the one of the oldest podcasts going but it's about 400 episodes and sometimes to start you need to start at the beginning and it's super daunting So I said, Mm. I don't want that. I don't want to make a podcast that you have to listen to episode one. So I was like, what if I made every episode uh, in no order whatsoever, all over the place, just pick one bombing, one attack, one person, and I made an open, closed story. And Mm -hmm. I've I've made up this term. I'm sure it's a real term, but it's like kind of like a jigsaw uh, education. So by the time you get through whatever 50, 60 episodes I have now, each one adds a different piece in a different direction. But, you know, now the episodes I'm putting out this season now, my listeners have kind of built up this background knowledge. So things all start to make a little bit more sense as they go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I, and I, I launched it as a true crime podcast because I just thought that the genre was actually um, a bit more desirable to go into. So three years ago, history podcasts were not as popular as true crime. Um, it is definitely a history podcast. Um, mm-hmm. I'll be in a recent history one. But so, yeah, that's kind of where I went. Yeah. I think it's both. Yeah, um, 100%. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think you, 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 you nailed it having each episode kind of stand alone. Uh, you, you don't have to go into it with all this knowledge. I remember learning Irish history in school in Ireland, and I'm like, yeah. okay, let's go back 1,200 years. <laughs> and it yeah, just, it, it's so daunting. It really is. And it, it's, it's so difficult to learn. I, and you're right. Look, yeah. I grew up right just south of the border. And, and I would not say that I grew up. Uh, in the troubles, I was on the periphery of the troubles. It, 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 I saw it with enough distance that it didn't really affect me in the same way Catholics from Northern Ireland or Protestants from Northern Ireland lived with it every single day. Um, yeah. But it, it uh, I, I think as I get older, I get more uh, kind of fascinated by history and, and how same. things evolve. And, and um, what, what's your what's your source of information? Uh, for, for some of these things, like when you when you want to do something about uh, the lock all ambush, right? Yeah. Where do you start? Well, um, it's going to sound pretty shitty, but I'd start at the likes of Wikipedia. I check it out in Wikipedia yeah. and then I go straight mm. down to the sources down the bottom and I go mm. through what do we have? What what are what are the because the, uh, Wikipedia is a very good, good concise telling of uh, what happened. Mm-hmm. So the sources at the bottom, in some cases, they'd be reports. In some cases, they'd be inquests. In some cases, they'd be inquiries. In some cases, they'd link to books. Um, I don't think they often they don't really often link to like YouTube documentaries. But then YouTube would be my next port of call. Um, and I've just I've gone digging so much into like I know there's a documentary the BBC released in the 1990s. How do I get that? Who can I get that of? Um, mm. Sometimes I might try and find the maker of the documentary and reach out to them. Um, yeah, and then kind of, again, as I kind of progress with the podcast, because, you know, a lot of people, somebody wants to interview me or, and they'd be like, oh, I want to hear your story of growing up in the Troubles. Northern Ireland for me as a kid was just where we went to get fireworks. It was something that was mm-hmm. so out of my frame of reference. Um, so as kind of the podcast progressed, I've now started to, and I guess as I got a bit more confidence, you know, when I released this, I released this anonymously. Um, I just wasn't too sure where it would land. Um, mm-hmm. So I was just a bit uncertain. Then after episodes five or six and the feedback was amazing, I put my name on it and kind of became more public with it. But, um, and then, you know, it just became quite important to me to not be speaking for other people all the time. I think that gets infuriating, especially to people in Northern Ireland. It's infuriating mm-hmm. to have podcasters and everybody writing about them. So um, I, I don't know when I started this, but now I've really started reaching out directly to people. 
So, you know, and I think it's really important just to get them on and tell me their story. And in some cases, you know, so the, like, I got this ridiculous one. I got this lovely author guy reached out to me, recommended me do, what do you say? He's like, oh, there's this great author who wrote a book about torture in Northern Ireland, this American author. So I reached out to him. I was like, hi, do you want to talk about your book? And he was like, no, I've forgotten everything. I'd be a terrible person to interview. He was like, but maybe talk to this person. He'd be quite good for this. So say this person was Jim Owled. Jim Owled was one of the hooded men. And the hooded men were, um, I think it's 13 men, who when about when a couple of hundred people were rounded up in the 1971 as part of, of the internment policy of the British Army, this was their attempt to just smash the IRA by arresting everybody. But the problem is their intel was pretty bad and the people they interned for up to 10 months, a lot of them weren't in the IRA. But of course, mm-hmm. after being held without questioning mm-hmm. or any liberties, they they left and they, a lot of them yeah, probably signed they up. they were. Yeah. Yeah. So so Jim was one of 13 who the British Army decided to use advanced interrogation techniques. So Jim was hooded and basically he was subjected to what I would probably call torture. Uh, The European courts have not called it torture. Um, The British Army have not called it torture. So it's still an ongoing thing. These men are actually the surviving men are still kind of trying to get it proven that it was torture. But it amounts to, you know, standing in a position with a hood on your head against a wall for seven days no food, a tiny bit of water, loud, no, very loud, shrill noise nonstop. Very reminiscent of kind of Guantanamo. And like so much so that when people accused of what was happening in Guantanamo was being torture, the US government said, well, no, it was ruled that what happened in Northern Ireland is not torture. So therefore mm-hmm. what we are doing is also not torture. So anyway, yeah. that's a roundabout way of saying, I reached out to Jim, um, he's in his seventies. We tried Zoom, it didn't work. I had no work the next day with my other job. So I said, Jim, will I just drive up to you? Um, so I drove up with my microphone. Uh, I was welcomed very warmly into his house. We had a cup of tea with his wife. Um, in Northern Ireland? And then, yeah, yeah, in, Belfast. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, you know, and then he was like, okay, well, we do it. And we went into his living room. And then, you know, like I, I was this guy asking some man to tell me about the worst seven days of his life. Um, and it's a lot, you know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's. It was a really, it was a really, like Jim was an excellent speaker in the points that he made. It's what I launched this season, season four with. But so so now in a very roundabout way, sorry, I waffle a bit. Um, that kind of got me to say, I want to speak to people and have them tell their story that I can publish and put out there. So mm-hmm. I just think it I, I think it's the it's the natural progression of this this podcast, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um it's funny you talk about enhanced interrogation. Uh, <laughs> I've been waterboarded, I've been beaten, I've been uh sleep deprivation uh not not for seven days but it's part of our training here it's part of the pipeline because you have to be able to resist uh, and be smart about what you resist right there's no point in getting pieces chopped off for stupid information to mean nothing to anybody right so it's it's called seer it's a survive evade resist escape it's a school that's part of the pipeline here and uh, it, it even after just a couple of days it does mess with you mentally. Like to have the white noise yeah. playing, children crying. You know what I mean? Like that, that, the, the repeated uh, re screaming and on loudspeaker. As a result of what happened, none of the men died mm-hmm. like, dur- during the interrogation, but yeah. a few of them did die quite young, younger than they yeah. should have, and their lives were never the same. One of them came out with his hair completely white, right? That I, I'm I not remember sure. seeing I that. that somewhere. I think that was in that book. Uh, Say nothing. That that's a book about the the IRA. It's it's actually quite a good book. It I recommend that to everybody. That's that's yeah, one of yeah. the better introductions to it, Jim. Yeah, I like I like that book. So, um, the when you so you've got your 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 source information right, and yeah. you, you lay it out. Do you write it all out first? Um, yeah, kind like, of build, build okay, a script. So- yeah, so let's say I just started an episode yesterday and I'd love to get it written today. Uh, I'm about to go on a tour now for eight days. Uh, I work as a, as a guide. We'll get to that later. But um, yeah. so I just, I wouldn't mind having something dead in the evenings. So I just started the uh, the Enniskillen bombing or the Remembrance Day bombing, which happened in 1987. Um, and that was the IRA planting a bomb, trying to get, um, I guess they wanted to get soldiers who were taking part in a Remembrance Day parade, mm-hmm. but they ended up getting uh, women and children, couples. They, they right. killed like three couples of elderly people. Um, so, yeah. So how did I start yesterday's research? Basically, I, I did the trove. I went through the all the sources I could find. I found three excellent documentaries 
Um, and then I kind of look for where these go because it's all, each episode is world building. So this documentary, is, I'm so excited. Well, I hate, I, I hate the way I talk about this, but when you do get writing, it is, it, it's, it's mm-hmm. exciting and it's, it's a, it's a heck of a story. So this, this, this episode now is going to start with a, a boat off the coast of France that was boarded by the French officials and was just loaded with explosives. Was that, that Maria uh, Anne? No, the Marie Dan was a different no. cup of tea. That was coming from okay. the US. This one is, I, as far as I'm aware, I haven't, I'm still in the researching phase. I'm pretty sure this one is coming from Libya. This is the Libyan. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And they were all destined for Ireland, basically. So now, mm-hmm. so using these three documentaries now, I'm going to weave together a story that'll involve um, the very linear, you know, A to B. They planted the bomb, they blew up the, bo- uh, they blew up the bomb, people were killed, and then there was a quest to find out who did it. But it's also how we got to this context. It's 1987. The IRA are getting starved by the British Army. They're going to try and block their ability to buy weapons, and they're going to try and block their ability to import weapons. So it kind of leads out like that. So I'll do kind of, I don't want to call it a table of contents, but um, you know, it, I'll do kind of the intro, the background, without getting repetitive, because every background could be the same if I'm not careful. Mm-hmm. So you have to make it a very s- specific background. Um, and then, you know, understanding what happened, why it happened. And with a very, very, my main focus, I guess, in a way, is, is try to be as victim focused as possible. I think that means mm. that's the best way of remaining impartial. The only, the people that I, I'm really sympathetic to are the innocent, well, innocent victims is a funny word, but are the, are the victims who died, I think is very mm-hmm. important. Yeah. So I remember so at it, the time, I remember at the time when that bomb went off, the, uh, you know, there was a whole propaganda war between the, the IRA and the British, right? And that, that's every war is like that. And they call it information operations. And some are better at it than others, but both are very good at it. Um, yeah. The IRA at the time said that the British came in and they flooded the place with frequencies and they detonated the bomb early. Do you remember, did, did you read anything about that? I haven't got to uh, that yet. No, I just, I'm only about yeah. an hour into research yet. Re- I research so, while I write as well, because otherwise yeah. you lose too much stuff on the way. Right. So the, the, the British obviously said the IRA detonated the bomb early to kill civilians, right? The IRA said that bomb detonated early because the British went in and they have the ability to flood the airwaves basically with radio control frequencies to okay. detonate bombs. And, and that does exist. We use that in Afghanistan and Iraq. We would go in and we would like, on, especially on the smaller roads in, in Afghanistan, you would fly a plane along that, that road and blast frequencies out. Oh, so you're not, you're not trying, you're not trying to, so say with the British Army's you, defense be now again, I haven't got there yet, but with their defense be we are blocking the ability for you to trigger the bomb and the IRA be saying, no, you detonated it. Is that what yeah. You, so you can do both, but okay. the IRA at the time, if I'm not mistaken, I'm walking off memory here. The IRA at the time said that the British deliberately detonated, they deliberately blast the frequency out there to detonate the bomb if there was any in place, which okay. who knows, who knows what's true. I think there's uh, there's two sides to every story and then there's there's the middle. That's probably the course, truth, yeah. right? But I, I just thought it was an interesting thing. That technology exists and, and it, it, it did exist back then. So that that whole information thing was was a cat and mouse game the whole the whole well, hit through the troubles. I'd imagine that's something the British Army would absolutely never admit to. Yes. You know, because again, yeah. that'd be mm-hmm. again a lot yeah. of the troubles. A lot, I hate to say, it, but a lot of the troubles was PR. It was good PR, yeah. bad PR. And mm-hmm. the IRA were though they had, you know, though in a way the IRA and the cause of nationalism had the sympathy of the world. Mm-hmm. They also did a lot of things that that made them hated. You know, like one one of the interesting yeah. ones I always thought was um oh it was the Ulster Workers Council strike. I think it was seventy four seventy five. But basically, um. Yeah, I think it was post Sunningdale. It was the first agreement that was trying to get peace in Northern mm. Ireland and wasn't liked by by unionists whatsoever. Mm. So so much so that um, sorry, I think it was the UBF or the UDA, one of the the loyalist uh, groups, decided to detonate a bomb in Dublin and Monaghan, uh, which got, mm. caused a lot. I think they killed about thirty people. It was a quite significant bombing. But weirdly enough, like say if an IRA bomb went off in Northern Ireland, um, everyone would kind of be angry at the IRA but when the loyalist bomb went off in Dublin the general consensus was people weren't angry at the loyalists they were angry at the IRA you brought this bombing campaign to our doorsteps Mm -hmm. so it was just kind of a different kind of perspective than you'd expect if you know what I mean yeah yeah, look the IRA were very very good at PR but at the same time their bombs killed the IRA uh, the um, provision uh, sorry what's the way to phrase it mm, sorry Republicans there we go Republicans killed 
more people in the troubles than anybody else, significantly more than the British Army and significantly more than loyalists as well. So they'd be the number one massive scale of, of, of you know, innocent death. Yeah. Um, the, have you done one about collusion yet? Uh, the... Collusion is like a chapter in every episode at this stage. It really is. Yeah. So, you haven't yeah, done yeah, one really... specifically for it. I didn't think so. Um, when, when, uh, looking at let's do this for people who are looking going man i wish i knew more about this can you give me like a a short kind of uh overview of basically the british invaded ireland and took yeah. all the land and, and 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 rented it back to the people right and then yeah. just just I'm, I'm sure you just yeah just yeah, yeah I, I just did an hour ago so it's still fresh in yeah. my head just do no, it yeah uh, just do it in a nutshell yeah yeah well basically um you can kind of say around the 1400 but let's push it around the 1600s where the as part of the the now again i'll make some mistakes here guys because it's not it's not fresh in my head but as part of the the english occupation of ireland or coming into ireland there was a number of plantations all around the country the whole island of ireland those plantations that'll bring our people in and push the native irish out and away in a lot of cases, these plantations were focused on the most, um, I guess, fertile land in a way. So around Ireland, um, many of these plantations were unsuccessful and the people were moved off or they're not supported by the local Irish who were angry to have this happen to them. But in Northern Ireland, it was very successful. Um, it was a lot of Scottish settlers that came over and planted there as part of the Cromwellian plantation. And the native Irish were given two options. Um, they, were, they could go to hell or they could go to Connacht which is the west coast of Ireland, Connemara, where the land is is very difficult to till. And, to you know, it's, it, that's why there's so many stone walls in the west coast of Ireland. And, and that's why they still speak Gaelic there. Yeah, the absolutely. Didn't bother with it. <laughs> yeah. They weren't too pushed. They weren't too pushed. Yeah. So then, like, okay, you're kind of looking at, but there was a lot of Native Irish who remained in Northern Ireland. So then you have, if you look at this sort of massive plantation in the 1600s, and then you kind of just literally, we're going to go quickly, fast forward on three, 400 years. It's like the 1900s. Suddenly you have, I think it was about 70%, 30% population uh, overall. It's a bit messy and patchy, but 70% Protestants, maybe 40%, like 60, 40, we'll say, um, and the rest were Catholics. But Catholics in Northern Ireland suddenly found themselves um, separated from the Re Republic of Ireland. That kind of happened around the War of Independence, I think, in the 20s. Um, so the six counties of Northern Ireland are considered, you know, one of the countries that encompasses the United Kingdom alongside Wales, England and Scotland. Um, but then again, you know, this is a government that's run by the United Kingdom. So any of the, the we could say Catholic, we could say nationalist, we could say native Irish. There's a load of different words. Usually people say Catholic or Protestant. But so any of the Catholics in Northern Ireland suddenly found themselves under a government that didn't support them. So bringing that to the 1960s, if you're a Catholic in Northern Ireland, you couldn't, uh, you could only vote if you owned a home. Very few Catholics did because, look, wealth only just, you know, this wealth disparity that was started in the 1600s only just got worse and got more significant, deeper. So Catholic people in Northern Ireland at the start of the 60s were essentially a second class citizen. They so they couldn't really vote. And any any communities where there was a majority Catholic, um, there was via the process of gerrymandering. If there was 90 percent Catholic, that place would be split up so much so that any of the representation in government would be all unionist. So they kind of say Northern Ireland was a unionist country for unionist people during this time. You know, Catholics, I think around the start of the 60s is when free education came in. So that means the Catholic population got to get free education. But like social housing, you know, if there was um, if there was a woman with if it was a Catholic woman with like five kids and her husband had died versus like a young unionist woman in her 20s, she would get the social, social housing with no kids. So it was just it just went on and on and on and until the Catholic people realized this is you know this is ridiculous like though apparently this is one thing i find interesting um the one thing that was slightly easier to do was open a pub and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot more pubs a lot more irish pubs all around the place i have to look a bit more into that but it's one thing that it makes yeah. sense to me i just don't understand yeah. exactly why so then it then we kind of get to martin luther king and martin luther king in the u.s and the civil rights movement inspired yeah. the catholic population in northern ireland they said well you know, we are in exactly the situation that the black population feels, you know, is in in the States. We're a second class citizen, a two tier government. We're not getting the same respect. So the Catholic population started peacefully protesting and singing. We will overcome like it was a very it was a very it was based very similarly on, on the Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, so here's where things get a bit messy then, because so then the unionist population at first or you see the police force. 
Um, I guess the way to put it is that these peaceful protests were met with violence. Now, in some cases, the violence was meter out, metered out by, I think, the B-specials. I might be wrong here. But they'd be kind of like, um, not police, but they'd be unionist people saying, let's attack these guys. And the RUC didn't do anything. And then in mm-hmm. some cases, the RUC themselves started violently attacking these protesters. So it was around this time that the IRA, that had been fairly dormant, um, they hadn't done too much. Uh, in the 50s, they had a brief border campaign, but not, not too much. That's where the the... Population in Northern Ireland, the Catholic population said, where are the IRA? We need you here to support us. But the IRA were like a little bit more socialist leaning. They weren't that into violence-ish. Um, and, but there was people in the IRA who said, no, we need to fight back. We need to get, get revenge. And that's where the IRA split. And the split group was like, oh, feck, what do we call ourselves? Look, we'll just put something on this and choose a name later. We'll, put a, we'll name ourselves the provisional IRA. Provisional means the name will change. The name never changed. So... Mm-hmm. The provisional IRA then were born, and with with this sort of chaos, eventually the police force and everything, the Northern Irish government just kind of went, it it lost control of the country, and that's when the British army were deployed into Northern Ireland. And again, in this case, the British army were welcomed by the, the Catholic people in Northern Ireland saying, oh, thank you, you'll save us against this biased police force. But then the British army started doing the same. The, 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 the government of the UK sent in shock troops. It sent in the, like the parachute regiment. It, se- it sent in troops designed for violence. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the likes of Bloody Sunday happened where the British army like killed civilians. And so every step of the way, I kind of feel like the British government made the wrong, made the wrong choices in the case of de-escalation. They, they unfortunately managed to escalate, escalate, escalate. And then, and then the paramilitary groups started to rise and then the attacks began. And then when 30 people were killed by one side, then 30 people had to be killed by the other side. And then it was a tit for tat cycle of violence that just raged for 30 years. So um, uh, it, it, I think that, it, does that make sense? It does. It does to me, right? But It's a lot. Um, I, 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 like everybody says, oh, it's Catholics and Protestants. And that's a byproduct of it. We, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's funny how you say the British sent in soldiers that were trained for violence. All soldiers are trained for violence. They're, they're true, trained true, for yeah. war. They're trained. Your job in the military is the consumption of human life. Like, I, it, there's no easier way to say it. Like, yeah, you're yeah. Trained. And to be put into that situation, that um, counter terrorist, counter freedom fighter, whatever, whatever, what name you want to use, it's a very difficult job for a soldier. I know. I was in Afghanistan yeah, and Iraq, right? So I know firsthand. And when you, and I'm not standing up for the British Army, they made horrible decisions. And But when you put soldiers in there, there's almost only one outcome because yeah. they're not, uh, they're going to meet violence with violence. That's how they're yeah. trained. Um, the uh, they and they generally overreact and and you know I I spoke to you for for the first time the other day and I talk I was we were talking about something like this but the more like if you if I'd have grown up you know ten miles north of where I grew up I would have been in the IRA because yeah. I would have had British Army breaking on my door and taking away my father and my brothers right I didn't have to go through any of that and that creates more fighters and. Yeah. Uh, I, when I was in a, one of the times I was in Iraq, uh, we breached a door with explosive charge to go in uh, and, and grab this guy. I, I can't remember. He was Al Qaeda. Um, and when we came back, my warrant officer said, hey, we need to stop breaching, explosive breaching to gain entry into a house because we're blowing out all the windows in the neighborhood and we're creating more enemies than we're rolling up. You just have to knock on the door. uh, Yeah. I I mean, right. Yeah. So (laughs) I I, I remember at the time going, I understand that that theory and it's absolutely correct. But as the guy at the breach point, as the guy standing there, that charge buys me 10 seconds to get in there on the top of that guy before he has time to react and get to a weapon. I'm trying to live through the next 10 minutes of my life. I don't have the the luxury of worrying about the geopolitical strategy. Right. And I think that happens a lot. The soldier on the ground is going to react. Now in the case of bloody Sunday in the seventies, the chain of command built up an atmosphere that made it okay. And, and, Bloody Sunday was a horrible day for civilians, but it was a horrible day for the British Army because it re- it built the IRA. People flooded to the IRA after Bloody Sunday, yeah. and it it I, it brought more recruits. 
I still think, uh, now again, I just don't know enough to, to really argue this point, but I still think deploying the likes of the parachute regiment that day was inappropriate. And I feel like the likes of the parachute mm-hmm. regiment would be a slightly different, a slightly, I don't want to say the word ruthless, because again, I'm trying not to, to, to use uh, aggressive words. Aggressive. Yeah, the parachute regiment yes. would be considered no, you're significantly right. more aggressive. To you're what right. was considered, to what were not considered, it was a peaceful march. But in these day, in, in these times, peaceful marches had a tendency to have young guys throwing rocks. Mm-hmm. And the young guys throwing rocks, I guess, was deemed the security threat. And then w- whether there was a shot fired, I think there might have been one shot fired um, somewhere. But at the same time, it was deemed that the the one shot that was fired, either by a British soldier or by um, mm-hmm. somebody firing a pot shot, that's what started it. That's what kind of the loss of gun control by the rest of the soldiers. Mm-hmm. And just went no, I, I agree with Joshin. Uh, the parachute regiment would be a more aggressive unit and they would be willing to pull the trigger a little quicker, I think, um, that than most of the units there. And I don't know what the answer is because you go into that, you're almost at a, in a in a no win situation. If you're an occupying force in a foreign country, take Afghanistan, take Iraq, yeah. um, serve them both. It, it's almost like a no win because you can be nice and you can you can be supportive and you can go into villages and you can build wells and schools and hospitals and feed the people and like we did in Afghanistan as soon as you leave the Taliban are coming in and they're executing the 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 village elder for talking to the Americans you can't you can't it, it no just way. escalates there's there's almost no yeah. way not to make it escalate um and one one thing I found oddly poignant I guess is I don't mean to be too jumping over topics but like I was yeah. in Derry two weeks ago mm-hmm. and on the way into Derry you pass by housing estate with parachute regiment flags everywhere because mm. they're just saying, you know, we support what happened. Because, again, right. you have to remember, the union's population in Northern Ireland now is threatened. They're feeling extremely mm-hmm. threatened. And they, it's very important that they, you know, I don't I don't know. But they they feel very threatened now. And it's kind of... Is it, it's a, I'm sorry. Is it through that uh, the Good Friday Agreement left in a provision that if the majority of the people in Northern Ireland want to become part of the Republic, that that is uh, feasible. And is it also true that this year is the first year ever that it looks like nationalists will outnumber unionists in Northern Ireland? Are those things true or no? Yes. Um, strangely enough, um, the different, one of the differences between like a nationalist or a Catholic family versus a unionist or a Protestant family Um nationalist families were having nine ten kids mm-hmm. simple as over the past 30 40 years and those my demographs fam- now I, I grew yeah. up in a family of 14 kids <laughs> yeah that was kind of the, my dad is one of like eight that's kind of the, that, it was kind of the norm in it's this. a small family mm-hmm. but um so it's undeniable that the demographics would shift so so yes the good friday agreement left a provision that if the time came it would have to go for a vote so just last year, the demographics shifted in favor of um, the nationalist population and even politically in the sphere. Um, I think Sinn Féin is the largest political party in Northern Ireland now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's missing one vital piece of knowledge, and that is that's presuming every nationalist would vote to be back with the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. To be honest, there are many, many, I think only maybe 60 percent of nationalists would vote. I think it's about that, maybe less, because, you know, being a part of the United Kingdom has its own um you know, it, it has, Benefits. you've, yeah, yeah, healthcare, the, the economic system, mm. the government system. So my overall, I personally think it probably will go for a vote if Brexit ends up making a, their living situation shite. You know, mm. if it, it becomes, if it becomes better to be part of the European Union, I think economics will drive everything and all of this yeah. nationalism and stuff will have been, won't make a difference when mm-hmm. you want money to feed your family, you want a good job, you want future right. prospects. So yeah. that's I, yeah. I think economics will drive everything. Um, I'd say we will have a vote maybe in thirty years, twenty or thirty years. I don't think anything. Yeah, else. let's say uh, let's talk about a couple of very very a couple of incidents where you when you did the research you were like, oh my goodness, this was this was either brutal or super interesting or I mean we can talk about it later on the infiltration by the security forces of of the IRA in, in intelligence um, was way more than anybody expected, but. Um, just even going back to the seventies or eighties, what what were some of the incidents when you when you researched them were just like shocking, mm. like oh, the Shanko some, butchers some, or something? Some you know, ones. yeah, probably, probably Captain Robert Nairak is one of the the more interesting right. ones. If you didn't, yeah, know, so, you know Nairak. Oh, I know about Nairak. So I when I was I remember growing up and hearing about Nairak when I was a kid, mm. and the rumor was that he was buried in Carlingford, which is 
not that far from where I grew up, and it's between Dundalk and Newry, right? It's it's yeah. halfway. That's where uh, Jean McConville was dug up when She's she was there. executed. Yeah, she was found in the Carlingford. So there was a lot of rumors about Nyrak. He is still one of the, the disappeared, never been found. Yeah, there's, there was about maybe 12 or 14 of the disappeared who were people who mm-hmm. were taken by the IRA and uh, executed, and then mm-hmm. their bodies were never found. But for, for from Nyrak, Nyrak is kind of fussy because he he was in this very kind of um, one of the British intelligence agencies called the FRU. Um, mm-hmm. And to be honest, it, there's so little information. It's very hard to know exactly what was going on there and what was being re- what what has been revealed or not. But Nyrak was it's kind of something I, I hear over and over again uh, when I've talked to anyone who was like undercover or like a double agent or anyone who was in, an informer, any of that sort of stuff. Um, you kind of expect them to be the quiet person at the back of the room listening. Mm-hmm. They're brazen. They get this sort of sense of kind of confidence. So what Nyrak did was he went to, it might have been Cross McGlen, I can't remember the town. Um, it was, yeah. It was, he, in, he, it was close to the border, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't really want to yeah. say he went rogue, but basically Nyrak went undercover and mm-hmm. he went to this town presenting as an Irish guy looking to, who knows what he was looking to do, but basically this is a British soldier who was very charismatic and very kind of chatty and very, very good at, I think he had an Irish accent. Did he have an Irish accent? But either way, he was very good at kind of doing the accent anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes into this Republican pub and he gets up on stage and he sings the yeah, broad Republican black songs. Yeah, he sings no. a Republican song. Yeah. And could you imagine the people looking at him going, mm. I don't think they'd clocked him yet, but the the death, the the thing he did that confirmed his death was after he was sitting, drinking, having fun. I don't know, was this sanctioned? I don't know what, what he was doing was sanctioned. It's still uncertain. But he asked, hey, is John Smith around? Whatever name. Mm-hmm. And that was it. Everybody in this town knew that this person was a person non grata. They'd been booted out of the town months ago. And, Mm. you know, to ask about him, a call was placed and a couple of guys showed up. And I don't know where the IRA or were they close to the IRA or whatever, but either way, a scuffle ensued and Iraq panicked and he went for his gun. I don't know to even panic, but like they, when he got out of the bar and he realized they were coming for him, he ran to his car to get his gun. But like there was, there was an army unit like two miles away. Mm. But I don't know, he didn't get to call. Maybe he didn't have a radio in the car. He just didn't Mm. get in time. He was taken, he was disappeared, and he was never heard from again. But the rumor was that he was put into uh, an industrial, like, meat grinding machine, which Mm -hmm. most of the people call absolute bullshit. Um, But I got a a message, like, three weeks ago, and he was like, do you want to know what happened in Iraq? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'd like to. And it was like, I worked in, um, I forget which prison it was, but one of the prisoners there, uh, this was in the 80s, he was like, one of the prisoners there, always had to sleep with the blue light on. And I asked him, like, oh, why? And he's like, oh, whenever this light is off, I have nightmares of Nyrak going into that machine. And again, mm-hmm. there's so much hearsay. There's ho- yeah. so much stuff. But because what he did was so um, blatant, you know, the IRA would have wanted to make a, um, what's the word, make an example of him. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why, I guess, in, in a way, the disrespect of, you know, to it's very important to have a body to kind of really mourn. Um, mm-hmm. And... I guess because of what he did and who he was, that'll probably never happen. And if 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 what happened to him happened, there is no body as well. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I will say, like, just from my point of view, from from my military background, number one, I heard that rumor about Nairac when I was a kid. And I yeah. heard that min- that meat mincing machine was in Carlingford, right? Um, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that way, like, decades ago. I'm um, interviewing the prison guard in a couple of weeks. Are you really? It'll be, yeah, it'll be an anonymous interview. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah. So when you when you think about a guy being on the cover like that, number one, very very dangerous. Number two, usually there would be a quick reaction force on standby, yeah. ready to go. And we 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 did not that type of thing, but we picked up sources in Iraq in, in downtown that were coming it was in. Always a cover officer, just like the undercover officer. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have you know you're all you're dressed up and you're armed and all that, but you have a, a quick reaction force very close by because your life expectancy is very very short if you get compromised. So to, for him to just to go out like that would be, I think he probably went rogue. I think he got think too so, confident. Yeah. I think every yeah. time he got away with something, he got a little bolder. And there was rumors of him being part of the Miami show band massacre and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I think uh, they've I, been, yeah, that's a hard one to know, but I think they've been probably, yeah. I don't think that worked into the time frame of it. Um, but yeah, that, that was a big one. Oh, so. okay. Yeah. I mean, he either was insane or he had serious cojones, man, and he was a brave man. Mm-hmm. But there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity because when you get rolled up, now you're, now you're a liability, right? Now you have intelligence. Yeah. 
and you, you people are going to have to risk their life to go look for you. So um, for, for people to think that he was a SAS guy and he was out there doing this sanction, I, I to me personally, with my military background, I, I highly doubt that. Um, yeah. Generally, those so high unless. Levels- Unless he could have been on something more uh, secretive, maybe. But again, because he did kind of flaunt. He didn't have a great relationship, I think, with the RUC. Or he was mm-hmm. a little bit arrogant, I think, with them. So yeah. unless he could have been on something else. But it, it's it's very hard to tell. But to go up on stage and sing an IRA song. I know. Ooh. For me, that's 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 going to be a movie at some stage. That's going to be wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, but um, there is they have they have interviewed the person who was there for his interrogation. You know, I think he mm-hmm. asked for a priest or he asked for a prayer. Like he was very, you know, he... His death was very, very gruesome and graphic, and there are accounts of it. There's just no accounts mm-hmm. of where his body went. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what, 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 are the, what are the other ones? Let's talk about the Shankill butchers. Uh, I guess an IRA killing. Let's talk about the uh, the the Shankill butchers and the uh, uh, loyalist, basically paramilitary group, but gruesome, gruesome murders. Yeah, they were they were kind of spearheaded by Lenny Murphy. Um, who was the UVF, basically. But this was kind of, this is where they decided that, say, if the IRA waged attack in attack, if the IRA killed an officer, they were like, well, look, we might not be able to get the IRA. Let's just get a Catholic. So Lenny Murphy and his crew, I think there was up to 12 of them. There was a lot of them. Um, they basically had, uh, one of them had an old, one of those kind of black cab tours that you'd see in Belfast now, one of those old black cabs. And another worked at like a meat, uh, a butcher's, I think. So he had access to all of the, like the deboning knives and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. So for a period of like eight years, um, what they would do is they'd cruise by um, kind of like, you know, Catholic areas. Uh, they'd look for young men coming out of a pub after a night of drinking and they'd, bun- they'd bungle him into a car and he would be, viciously and violently executed um and the accounts i read are absolutely horrific like bottles shoved into his neck and like really really unfortunate gruesome gruesome deaths Mm -hmm. um and so much so um how did it work i think they did you see a lot of the times i think they were drunk and in one case they 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 thought they'd killed a guy but they hadn't um i think he went and pointed them out you see everything these are are so many episodes Mm -hmm. in i'm pretty sure he Mm -hmm. went in the car and he pointed out who did it and that's kind of where the kind of the everything yeah i think went. the ruc drove him around uh yeah. hooded up and he, he to a loyalist area and he pointed one of them out yeah. once you got one and then you got the others and i mean they, they look on both sides psychopaths on both sides yeah. and these guys are, are serial killers basically who, who use the politics as, as a means um I, I think the uvf disowned them there at the end um, well, that, that's that's actually that's actually the interesting thing because uh, I'm just double checking this now because I want to get it right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, from what I from what I remember, anyway, we'll go with just remember. Go and listen to the podcast otherwise because somebody yeah talking yeah right. there you go. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. Lenny Murphy was either out or he was he was definitely out and he wanted to return to this campaign. But again, like I said earlier, PR was super important. The loyalists were like, look, we can't we can't be you know these murdering butchers. Like it's going to make mm-hmm. us look. It's not it's not a good look. And Lenny Murphy said, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm returning to this violence. So mm. it is believed that his whereabouts were passed to the IRA. Um, mm. I don't know, is there actually uh, proof on that? But so the IRA waited for him to come to I think, one of his girlfriend's houses and he was he was executed. But mm. it was believed that he was actually given up by his own because he was too much of a liability to the cause. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, yep. So it's, yeah, it's wild. I, I think the cause is, yeah, it's always going to be more important. Yeah. Than the, individuals, one of, right? One of the best examples of tit for tat, because I think with the troubles, it's always tit for tat. If you want, I'll explain these three of them. Uh, you'll probably be familiar with all three, but um, it starts in Gibraltar with the Gibraltar shooting. Do you know mm-hmm. that one? I remember so, yeah. it. I I, so, I was really? I was not there, but I remember it. Yeah, I was in the yeah. Irish Army at the time. Yeah. Um, those three those three incidents within a week or ten days were insane. Ten days, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it, go ahead. ethically. Ethically, it brings up everything. So that's that's why it's kind of it's a good example, I guess, of the the the, the complication when you think of the troubles. Because basically, there was an active service unit, what they called it, the IRA. One was Maraid Murphy, and then two guys. Uh, Maraid Farrell. Down, down, Maraid Maraid, oh, Farrell. sorry, Maraid Farrell. Yeah. <laughs> Maraid Farrell. She's yeah. a local councillor nearby. She wouldn't want to be yeah. named. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so basically, they travel to Gibraltar um, off the coast of Spain. It's like a British, I don't want to say colony or British um, mm-hmm. I don't know the territory. Yeah. Yeah. So so their plan was they were going to collect a bomb car. They're going to plant it nearby where there was a um, uh, every day. There's like, I don't know, it's a changing of the guard, but it's like a parade. Mm-hmm. They do a military parade. I think it's every week, actually. Yeah. 
Um, and their plan was they wanted to blow up and kill as many British soldiers as possible. Now, it's believed that these three were followed from leaving Ireland. The uh, British intelligence was aware of this. So they were never not followed. I think when they went to get the bomb car was the only time. So then on the dry run that they were doing, I think they were basically parking a car where they wanted to park their bomb car um, and they were going to swap out the cars. So they had to secure the parking place space. Um, while the three of them were walking, they were confronted by the British army who killed all three of them. So here's where it gets very complicated. Um, those three are still honored by the Republican by Republicans and Sinn Féin in Ireland as you know, heroes who died and were murdered by the British army as they were unarmed. The British army's position of it is like, well, they were on their way to try and kill a lot of people. But then you'd say, well, yeah, but could you not arrest them? The, you know, they'd say, well, we, don't, we didn't know if they had a detonator in, the, in their pockets. Mm. We didn't know. But I think all three of them were shot in the back and killed. Mm. And it was just, a, it, was, it was a, you know, it was a gruesome death. But it raises that ethical debate. Was it appropriate to shoot and kill them? A lot of people would say no. A lot of people would say yes. It depends on what side of the fence you're on. But it, was, it, was I, a, yeah. Yeah, it was a warning to the IRA. Do not do this outside Northern Ireland. Like it was a, yeah. they, they, they were, uh, uh, to me, the British army were sending a message. Um, I, 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 I often, you know, the, the whole shoot to kill policy and all this, the, the IRA wanted to be treated like soldiers and political prisoners in a war, but they wanted to be treated by, by the rule of law. Like when you arrest them, you know, um, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the defense was, oh, we thought they had a detonator and they'd blow up the, the thing. But I, Honestly, personally, my opinion, they knew they weren't armed. They knew what was going on. They just wanted to send a message. I think Thatcher was the president or the. the uh, I can't the, remember. Yeah, that would be I probably fit into think, the time frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that that would be her mo, right? You send a yeah. message. Um, but yeah, so so those three got killed by the British. And there's there's a documentary on YouTube that goes and interviews Spanish. Uh, citizens who saw what happened and, and recounts yeah, the whole yeah. thing. It's I actually quite, as a source, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of evidence that they were just executed, right? Um yeah. so those three get taken back to Ireland and I think they came in on the boat into the southern part of Ireland because I was in the army at the time and got driven up across the border. And then yeah. at their funeral in uh Milton Cemetery in Belfast, what happened? So then um, what is described as a freelance loyalist, um, which sounds a bit odd, but he's kind mm-hmm. of like, again, I don't think anybody wants to claim him at this stage, but this man by the name of Michael Stone. So as the mourners, as the bodies were being low, and this is actually on tape, you can watch this on YouTube, mm-hmm. but as the bodies were being lowered into the ground, uh, Michael Stone walked into the graveyard and threw two grenades into the crowd, and then he opened fire on the crowd. Um killing three people. So at the funeral of three people, a loyalist walked in, threw grenades at them and shot them and then ran. And the footage of him running across the graveyard being chased by a crowd that would have killed him. They had, mm-hmm. they just got him. They got him on the side of a motorway. And if they got him into a car, he, he would never, he, he would have been yeah. definitely disappeared. But they, he, the, I think the army or, or UC showed up and they, they saved him. They got him into a car mm-hmm. and they brought him away. So, so that was just, you know, this is like five days later and suddenly there's this another massive attack. So, the tension um, was was absolutely ridiculous now, and the heat of of the moment and killing mourners at a funeral like it was it was it was atrocious, absolutely atrocious. So then, at their funeral, so the next so, just, funeral, could, yeah, uh, uh, Oshin, real quick before you get into the next one, I remember at this time the IRA, not the IRA, that the. the Republican movement had a lot of sympathy around the world, right? Three of their members were executed by British security forces. They attacked a cemetery of mourners and it was all the propaganda value was massive. And then this next one happened and it took all that away. Right. Um, So, so at the funeral of the people who got shot by Michael Stone, like only like three, three or four days later. Right. Yeah, there was like a, it was a funeral cortege. So it was going down one of the streets. It was lined with people on either side of the streets. And here's again, where do we know the real story? Do we not know the real story? In the same way as in Iraq, something happened. There was three, I don't know, or two, sorry. um, Is the word Lance Corporal? Basically, there was a new soldier who just arrived at a barracks. And one of the soldiers, it's believed, brought him into an unmarked car. And they went, I don't want to say cruising, but they went, maybe he went to show him the ropes. Maybe he went to show him. Yeah, so... 
that that you know that's something that you know they would have known this would have taken place they would have known this funeral was happening mm -hmm. so by some some instance this man drove the car down and straight towards the funeral procession procession not speeding but he just took a turn down and suddenly he's driving forward and they're surrounded by a crowd um and they they panic they panic. The crowd is looking at them and doesn't know what's happening. Then somewhere along the way, he brandishes the gun. They, they, both of the soldiers had a... They were, again, they weren't dressed in soldier gear. They were in regular mm -hmm. clothes. But then he brandished the gun. The crowd thought, there's another attack. They're coming to kill us again. They're coming, blah, 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 blah. So the two men in the car were absolutely terrified. They were trying to speed off. The crowd pulled in. You, you, again, again, you can see this footage online. He shot mm -hmm. in the air. The crowd pulled back for a second and then they surged on him. And the two men were dragged out of the car. And then in full view of the media, um, the men, they were, I don't think they were quite, ex I think they were executed in another vehicle. I don't think they were killed. In, but they were basically, yeah. in, a, in a very quick period of time, they were mm. killed and dumped. And the media were then uh, accosted by members of the IRA going, give us your tapes, give us your cameras, mm -hmm. give us your tapes, give us everything. And then there's this famous photo of a priest, uh, Ryan, I think, it, Reed, Alex Reed, I think his name is, mm. delivering the last last rites to this bloodied man who had already yeah. died, I think, at this stage. But so basically, mm. I, I hate to, like a crowd just rushed upon the car and killed these two soldiers outright. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this is 10 days of absolute chaos. Um, and some very, very controversial killings that you, yeah. there's really, there's very little way to justify. I think all three of them, to be honest, um, yeah, in it, any way. Yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. And yeah. I, I remember at the time, everybody was like, what the hell is going on? How, yeah. we had, this has to chaos. stop. But of course chaos. it didn't stop, right? Because it went on for another freaking 20 years after that or whatever it did. Um, not twenty or ten years after that, at least I think that was in the eighties, right? Eighty-seven, something like that. Yeah, I'm saying my brain's um, saying eighty-six, but I think uh, it yeah. might have been eighty-six. Yep, yep. Um, the uh, horrific, horrific incidents. So let, let's talk about the Good Friday Agreement and, and how it kind of came about. Um, and then it, it kind of went off the rails a couple of times before it yeah. took hold. And it, it, it's still <laughs> it's still a little tentative, I think. Right. Or, or hopefully yeah. it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out of touch since I left Ireland, but um, it's my most yeah, recent episode. So it's the one I probably have the most uh, clarity. I listen on. to it. I listen the episodes, to it. Just yeah. After after five episodes, you totally forget yeah. a load of the stuff. So you need, I know, you need to right? Yeah, I did listen to your Good Friday one. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that agreement. Well, OK. Yeah. Well, there was a couple of attempts at. um a kind of uh, peace. So one of the first ones, like the Sunningdale Agreement, which was in the 70s, that was hated because it affirmed Northern Ireland as a part of the Republic of Ireland, I think. Again, you'll have to mm -hmm. double check some of these on me or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, just give it a Google. Then there was the Anglo-Irish Agreement, um, which again failed. That just upset everybody. So, you know, I was, again, uh, I was in uh, special ops in Ireland when that happened. And I did security for Margaret Thatcher when she came in to Dublin airport. And it was right after some of those shiploads of arms came in and it was believed that the IRA had surfaced air missiles to shoot down planes at that point. Now that was never proven. Um, and we spent a long time looking for it. Yeah. Right. But you know, you, you're coming in from England to Dublin airport. There's that, there's like a five mile stretch of land before you actually land. And it was feared that the IRA would shoot down Thatcher's version of Air Force One, right? Her plane. So her plane came in, landed, taxied, and just sat there for like 30 minutes. And then two Wessex helicopters came in and landed, yeah. and she got off one of the helicopters. The plane was a decoy. Wow, it was a decoy. Yeah, it was yeah. <laughs> That's how serious they took it, Bob. Yeah, well, uh, it had to be. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so like if you're coming then in you're coming up to the 90s and basically the IRA uh what's the word? Their 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 war was a war of attrition which essentially is like we'll we'll just keep going. We'll just keep going. We'll blow up as many barracks and police stations as we can in Northern Ireland and then we'll take that ground and seize it so they can't grow it back. We'll just keep going and going. Um so they the IRA like people pro pro provisions or whatever would say they could have gone forever. They could have kept going. But in reality um by this stage, the British intelligence was, the, people, I don't I don't know what the word is, but people have said parts of the IRA were like a sieve. There were so many informers, so much intelligence that it was becoming nearly impossible to operate without the operation being um, 
you know, like uh, toad on. Like, you know, we sh- we probably will talk about it now, but like, sure, the IRA's main executioner, who was the one who would seek out informers and he'd kill them, he was an informer for the British government. Yeah, you know, it a was big one. so. Yeah, he just died yesterday, Freddie Scapatici. Oh, did he? Scapatici. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be some interesting things coming out of his mm. death, but we we can come back yeah. to that. But basically, um, so. You know, like you could kind of say, were the IRA winning? Were they not? The IRA's goal was an independent Ireland, and they believed that look, if violence wasn't working, we'll go to the the ballot box. And Sinn Fein had made some significant um, progression since the hunger strikes in the early nineteen eighties. So, you know, eventually they just they needed to come to an arrangement, uh, or sorry, they they needed to figure out a way to make peace to bring an end to it. So that was where the Downing Street Declaration came in. That was like ninety two or ninety three, and that was where they agreed that there would be peace talks. And that if the peace talks were to happen, then there would be a ceasefire between the different groups. So, yeah, that was kind of the start of it. But it was really, really messy because um, the Brit- it, when the so then when it went on to the peace talks, this is when Bill Clinton sent over George Mitchell to be the chair of the peace talks. So George Mitchell was a very prominent U.S. senator at the time. And the peace talks would take place between George Mitchell at the chair. Then you'd have Tony Blair from England. You would have Bertie Ahern from Ireland. And then you would have I think it was 10 political parties in Northern Ireland that then eventually went down to eight. But for any of them to enter into these talks, they all had to agree to what was called the Mitchell principles, which were like, essentially, there's a load of, there's a load of them, but essentially saying we will have a ceasefire and then we will be allowed to take part in these talks. So that's essentially what happened. But the IRA were then speaking through Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin and the IRA were kind of, one was political, one was violent, but they were kind of all in the same bed together at this stage. Um, and the proviso of Sinn Féin entering the talks was a complete ceasefire by the IRA, which they were okay with. And they did an initial ceasefire. But then the British government demanded that they put all of their weapons beyond use, that they put away all of their weapons. And the IRA didn't trust that these peace talks would lead to peace. And they were like, no, we will only put half our weapons away or we'll start doing the steps. And it took them about a decade to, I think. So that's where things got kind of messy. Um, and that's where the IRA then, they had a ceasefire, I think, from 94 to 96 or 95 mm-hmm. to 96. And then they woke it up by this massive Canary Wharf bombing, it's called, in London, which luckily, well, not luckily, but it killed, I think only one or two people were killed in a very, very significant bombing. So um, it was just a very good um, evacuation procedure. I think in Manchester, then there was another bombing too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know how far I keep going with it or I don't know how, how much, you, you know, but it, it, yeah. it then, then led to the peace talks that were just so difficult. And so it took two years before they could even agree on what the topics were. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of in a lot of cases, like um, David Trimble, who's the head of the UUP, the Unionist, Ulster Unionist Party, he wouldn't even speak to members of Sinn Féin. Mm-hmm. Um, who were there. So they're, 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 you're sitting at a round table talking to people where half of these people refuse to speak to the other half. Um, I spoke to Bertie Ahern two weeks ago and he said that um, Ian Paisley didn't shake his hand for eight years because Ian Paisley wow. was with the DUP mm-hmm. who was at the talks but the DUP left the talks mm-hmm. after the admission of Sin- Sinn Féin once Sinn Féin were back mm-hmm. in the DUP said no no yep. so the DUP mm-hmm. left and then eventually of course the, the agreement was, was was done but the agreement kind of was the end of these centre middle parties on either side of the fence so SDLP which were the Nationalist Party and the UUP, the Ulster Unionist Party, they ended up getting, losing, they had the dominance throughout most of the Troubles or most of that sort of era. And then it went out to the fringes. Then the DUP became the dominant uh, Unionist Party in Northern Ireland and Sinn Féin became the dominant Nationalist Party. Mm -hmm. So of course that's, you know, it put everything straight onto the fringes. And then the DUP and Sinn Féin have been essentially leading the country since 2008, um, you know, together. But the DUP are the ones who didn't want the Good Friday Agreement in the first place. They're mm-hmm. the ones who refuse to take part, who left the talks. So, mm-hmm. you know, how how do you expect for these people to get along? And they haven't been getting along. They've collapsed. Mm-hmm. You see, again, one of the biggest problems in Northern Ireland is if the two sides disagree over some scandal or something that happened, they can collapse the government and nothing gets done. Yeah. So in the, mm-hmm. what's the word? I think in the 23 years that the Northern Irish government has been operating since the, the peace agreement, it's been collapsed for eight years. Mm. eight years of no progress that's insane yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. i i assume things have gotten better for catholics under this in northern ireland or is that an assumption they can be in the police no, now no. They can, they, yeah 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 well that was all part of the good friday agreement if it, it, they disbanded mm. the ORUC, they set up the, they set up the psni mm. and the, the new police service they got rid of a lot of the barracks yeah oh absolutely 
the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland finally had peace. They finally could go to the shop and not be afraid of blowing up in a car bomb. Mm-hmm. You know, but that's like yeah. like like with the original split to the provisional. That's where the provisional then split to the real IRA and then the new IRA. So and then they're the ones who are determined to continue the campaign of violence. And that's what led to four months after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the OMA bombing, which was a massive bomb detonated by the say the reader, the new IRA. I always get them mixed up, um, which killed men, women, children. Catholics, Protestants, Spanish people, like it was a, it was a disastrously violent bomb that it, it, I always kind of say in the way the Bloody Sunday heralded in the troubles, the disgust caused by the Oma bombing and how it killed so many people and unborn mm. babies and everything that just heralded it out. People were like, we don't want this ever again. We don't want yeah. this. And so, I think they were they, they probably had been given a little bit of hope. With, with the Good Friday Agreement, right? And they were like hanging on to this little, and then this thing happened. And yeah. it was, um, you remember how many people were killed? There was a lot. Like I think it was 31. Um, Jeez. And I then there was so. a very famous photograph of a, a man standing in front of the, the car before it detonated yeah. with a child in his arms. Um, like just horrific. And people were like, they, okay. So 29 people died. They survived the bombing, but the photographer was killed. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and again, it was it was down to uh, I don't know what to phrase it. Basically, they they wanted to plant a bomb at the courthouse. Yeah, they couldn't find parkings. So they planted it maybe three hundred meters down the street. I walked the street. It's about a five minute walk from one mm-hmm. end to the other. And um, so the police get a call saying there's a bomb at the courthouse, and they evacuate everyone from the courthouse, and everyone was evacuated evacuated into the bomb. Mm-hmm. So, and the IRA said, "Well, we phoned in a, a car bomb warning. Yeah, but you phoned in a com- car bomb warning for three hundred meters away." You know, so it's 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 it's, sho- it's shocking mm. and awful. And um, the other yeah. big sticking point of the Good Friday Agreement was the release of prisoners, right? So yeah. everybody got out, to include Michael Stone, who attacked that funeral, and and people on both sides who did horrific I, things. I think he's gone back in. I think so. Has he? he? Too long. I think. Um, yeah, I, he might be back out now. But he he approached Stormont with a knife. And he tried to walk into the House of Parliament with a knife or Not something. Not the most actually. stable guy. Yeah. And no, and again, no. horrific violence on both sides. And and people and, and I, I think a provision of them getting out was that they don't they're on probation almost. And if they get back in Yeah, Paramount, it's a license activity. of release, it's called. It released yeah. over oh, geez, I think yeah. it was maybe four hundred people. Um, um because look, at the same time, to make peace. There's no point in making peace with the political parties. You have to make peace with the people who are willing to carry out the violence. And the vast majority of these people who killed people in the name of this conflict, um, you know, they would argue they wouldn't have killed people in any other circumstance in life. You know, there's a there's a very harrowing interview, I think, during the peace process where Michael Stone sat down. I think it was with the wife of somebody that he killed and Desmond Tutu, because he was part of the peace process. He was this famous mm-hmm. archbishop from South Africa, I think. Um, and like Michael Stone tried to, I think he tried to either hug her or shake her hand or whatever. And she has to just leave in disgust. She was so upset. It's, it's not, it's, it's a very unpleasant interview. Um, but like, so the, so yeah, the prisoner release really, really, really upset the unionist population in Northern Ireland, who, mm. who in a way I think separated things a little bit. I, I don't think they were even happy to have their own, you know, people who killed in their name, in the name of unionism. Mm. They didn't want, they just saw like 400 murderers are about to be released. Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure what the opinion of us on the other side, on the nationalist side. Like, it was necessary. The vast majority of people who were released never killed again. Um, mm-hmm. I did come across a stat saying that, that 80% of them have not worked in that time. I don't know if that's, again, socioeconomics. I don't know if that's just, it's very difficult. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's it was it was probably the most contentious issue for the whole Good Friday Agreement. The release of, like, even the Shankill Butchers. People mm. who killed maybe 13, 14 people were released and yeah. free. And Insane. that's a lot. Mm-hmm. That's a heavy, that's a very heavy burden to. to it uh, really is. You know. uh, where where does uh, where does Northern Ireland sit now? Like um economically, and is it still like a powder keg or is it somewhat stable? Or like where is this Brexit thing going to influence? Uh, on your in your opinion, what what what's what's in the future here? The marginalized community now would be the DUP and unionism in a way is becoming marginalized. You know, there were people, pro- Joe Biden arrived to Belfast today and there were people protesting saying, go home, Provo Joe, Provo Joe, King Joe, you're in the provisionals mm-hmm. because they believe that everyone is 
against them in a way, you know, and at the mm. same time, what's problematic for unionism in Northern Ireland is they see themselves as British and loyal to, to England. Um, you know, I'd love to, I'd love, I'd really like to speak to someone in unionism. I think my, I need to work on my, my um, arguing with that because I just need to speak to someone who can explain it to me better. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the United Kingdom doesn't particularly seem to make much of an effort to care for Northern Ireland at all as one of its, mm-hmm. its countries and stuff. So a lot of people in Northern, in, in England would be like, oh, they're just Irish. Yeah. You know, um, so it's it's good, but it's not great. Um, there was a John Caldwell, um, who was a, a, a PSNI officer in Oma, who was um, violently shot about a month ago. Uh, mm. I don't, he, I, I won't say anything, but basically he's put in a coma and he was riddled with bullets, basically. Um, I don't think it's looking good. It's been very quiet mm-hmm. in the news for the past month, so I have a feeling it might not be great for him. Um, mm. So like this is this is a month ago. Now, this attack mm. is purported to have been carried out by nationalists, these new real IRA guys. Mm. Um, but they did, during their in, during their investigations, there were loyalists also arrested, um, which doesn't make any sense. I don't know why these two would be working together mm. to, to try and execute a, a, an officer. Mm. So, um, I don't know. Um, the, the DUP are a very difficult party because, I guess, in a way, um, because, they, you know, they're the leading unionist party right now. Some people call them dinosaurs, you know, uh, it's very hard if you're a moderate unionist in Northern Ireland, even supporting the DUP is quite difficult. You know, they're against like gay rights. They're, they're a party that seems to be kind of a little bit back in the past a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, they had a leader of the party there recently who didn't believe in dinosaurs. He believed the earth was created 4,000 years ago or something. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's, I, I really want to speak to one of them and I'd love to hear the DUP suggest what, instead of just saying no to everything, they said no, they said yes to Brexit. They said no to the Northern Irish Protocol. They, they're, I think they're still saying no to the Windsor Treaty, which was the adjustment on that. Um, so, you know, what what can be done to kind of, to, to make this 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 community agree, I guess is the way to say it, you know? Mm, yeah. It's difficult. Um, so, yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're against everything, then, then you're for nothing. Yeah, you gotta, yeah. You know, you, in a negotiation, you don't get everything you, you want, right? You, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta bend a little bit. And there was a lot of bending done by all parties to get the Good Friday Agreement done and to get somewhat peace. I think, you know, all the, uh, not all of it, but a lot of the support the IRA had in Northern, in, from America would have been hurt after 9 11. I, I think the American public looked at that stuff differently after 9 11. Columbia. But, but yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. Are they, did, did those guys ever get out? The guys that were in Columbia training the FARC? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I'll explain it, but basically, um, where did they get arrested? But ba- it, it, so yeah. look, you're in the IRA. The IRA excelled at um, a lot of their their types of attacks, and one particular attack was called their mortar bomb technology, which you probably would have seen. I, I believe it was probably I believe actually the IRA, the IRA pioneered what you probably saw and fought against in Iraq. I'd imagine because mm-hmm. I think I think yeah. that, that technology was used over there as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah I, basically, I, I, I've seen I've there. seen I'm sorry I've seen IRA vans when I was in the Irish Army that were set up for it and defused right before they got across the yeah. border, and it had. Uh, it had the mortar tubes inside. It's not a conventional mortar. It's shooting gas canisters yeah. and they fly through the air like this and make a horrific noise, but devastating when they hit and they had them rigged up in the back. And, and I've seen this van they had them rigged up in the back and rows of six or four or whatever. And th- the one I saw was rigged with uh, lights to show how it, it, it didn't, it fired them in a specific sequence to keep okay. the van stabilized and the roof was cut off and a tarp was put across it. So it was from the air. It looked like it had a roof and yeah. just pulled it, pulled the roof, pull the tarp off, set the timer and walk away. And when it fired all its mortars, it detonated and blew up all the evidence, you know, um, yeah. they, they really got good at it. And yeah, and- so, they, so they needed they needed money. Uh, FARC in Colombia had a lot of money. They had a lot of drug yeah. money. So somewhere along the way, over a period of, I think, five years, about 12 men left Northern Ireland. This is uh, around 99, 2000. Uh, around 2000, I think. And it's believed that they went over to Colombia to train FARC rebels in how to use these mortar te- th- this mortar technology to, to wage war. And FARC went on to their devastated, devastated civilians with this and some other stuff as well. Um, so then they, they get caught. Uh, and like, I guess for the people of the US, it, it was I think it was just before 9-11. But then you're kind of saying like, okay, um, you know, we support the IRA's cause or whatever. But they're like, wait a sec, we we don't like FARC. 
and these people are helping FARC. And that was one of the turning points. I think this was post 9-11, they were called actually, but it was all around the same time that just kind of made, suddenly the word terrorist suddenly yeah. started to come out. That's a word I never use in the mm. podcast. I just don't like mm-hmm. using it. But suddenly that sort of kind of, that that thinking came about. Um, mm. And I, I believe, I believe it lost a lot of support for kind of this, this Republican cause or whatever, or just changed perceptions, yeah. especially in the States. I remember when, uh, you know, the Irish Army are in Lebanon uh, and have been for a long time. They would have for a while, but I was in Lebanon twice when I was in the Irish Army. But I remember talking to an older guy in the Army and he'd been in Lebanon in like 82 or 83 or something like that. And they were driving from South Lebanon up towards Beirut. I, I don't know where they were going, but they got stopped by a PLO checkpoint. And the PLO said, uh, and I can't substantiate this. I, I'm retelling a story that was told to yeah. me. But he told me that the PLO stopped them on the checkpoint, the Palestine Liber- Liberation Organization. And they said, oh, you're Irish. Oh, we have Irish in our camp up the road. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, but, uh, you never know. You never know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very um, good, they, uh, okay, let's say, uh, let's talk about what you do, basically, when you're not doing the Troubles podcast. Let, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah, so... um. I, like I said, I used to work as a hiking guide in Italy uh, for this American company. And then I kind of came you've home. Do- but- you've been to the Dolomites? Yeah, I love the Dolomites. I, I try and go every year. Yeah, it's my, <laughs> it's the most beautiful place in the world, I think. It's just mm. phenomenal. Um, mm. So, yeah, so I came home. Uh, geez, it was kind of one of those everything moments. Like, ba- big breakup, big job was gone. COVID hit. I moved back in my parents. And I was like, fuck me. Like, this is just pure reset. You're going um, the wrong way, right? You're yeah, going the wrong not, direction. Not what you wanted. <laughs> not what you wanted. So mm-hmm. my, my dad had left his job in the bank. Um, and he, he my dad's a petrol head. Like he's always had cars. He's always had to be in a car. All of his jobs revolved around him driving. He used to be a, he used to race cars in Mondello. He was a driving instructor. He was a commentator. It's just everything about dad's cars. Um, so he decided to get into the chauffeur industry. So you kind of buy, buy a nice black car and then you kind of do the business chauffeuring and then you occasionally get the odd... Um, Kind of tour so he was like look get your chauffeur license um get a big car so i i like have a, a six-seater kind of mercedes van um and then i started basically doing a lot of corporate work but i kind of well, I, I, that doesn't suit me I, I like to talk i love to show my country off um so for the past two years now i've been doing kind of like guided tours of ireland basically so like i pick people up in the airport i drive them all around ireland bring them to all these hotels i'd be like a driver guide kind of for private tours of ireland is how we call it so um yeah, I've been doing that now. I'm just about to go on a tour tomorrow. And yeah, I've got my summer is pretty booked now up until July. Um, and I have a bit of free mm. time. But I'd imagine that the tours will keep coming in. So and I I, I really enjoy them. You know, you, you never know who you're <laughs> going to get in the car. You never know what stories or what frame of reference they're coming at. Um, mm. And I, 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 I hate to sound cheesy, but I'm just really passionate about Ireland. You know, I yeah. love Connemara. Mm-hmm. I love the Dingle Peninsula. I love doing Northern Ireland, but the legalities are a bit weird. You can kind of only go up and come back. Um, mm-hmm. yeah there's, there's ways so yeah so that's kind of that's kind of what i've been doing now and i think that um yeah it's a dilemma it's either go full-time podcasting or go full-time tour guiding i've been doing both now quite successfully for the past two years so mm-hmm. i, I, so guess, yeah, you I have, guess you can do both do you have a website mm, yeah so our website is mgf chauffeur service.com and that's M we'll, we'll put day. we'll put it in, we'll put it in the notes on YouTube. Yeah, but it's, it's and, and a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that one's geared a little bit more towards to, uh, towards uh, business work. But we, I will eventually get around to making one that's more. Uh, mm-hmm. scenic, you know. Okay. Cool. And the Troubles Podcast. What's how many seasons you done now? Uh, I'm in the middle of season four now. Season four. So I do okay. fifteen episodes a season. Um, and wow, I, people that's are always a like, lot. "Yeah, people are like, when are you gonna finish? You're you're gonna run out of stuff." But like, I've I. I've had some of the most insane conversations and fascinating people that I've met uh, this season mm-hmm. that that will. So I, I've at least another season in the bag. I'm working on another really interesting project um, mm-hmm. about an undercover operation in the UK. So mm-hmm. that is all kind of loosely related to a um, a murder of a solicitor in Northern Ireland. And then this phenomenal operation that was launched in the UK um, called Operation George. So I'm kind of working on like a, a, a standalone season about that basically mm-hmm. so, what was that solicitor's name was he the one that was representing the ira and he was killed in front of his family not pat finucan no, no. This, pat is, finucan, um, yeah. this was rosemary nelson uh she was okay. executed by an lvf bomb so the lvf were a much smaller um loyalist yeah. paramilitary group so yeah, yeah well I, I can i can explain that if you want it's a very interesting story or are we on time let's do i i don't care drive on <laughs> people keep 
every time I do a podcast, people are like, you need to do longer podcasts. I'd be like, man, I run out of steam. But go ahead. You're, you're doing most <laughs> well, of the talking. I got as much. I'm, I'm playing football in a couple of hours. I got a bit of time. Okay. So, um, mm-hmm. well, basically, so this was 2001. Um, she was kind of perceived as a solicitor who represented uh, primarily uh, nationalists and Republicans, I guess. So that put a target on her back. Um, also, that word collusion comes into play a little bit because it was believed that the RUC really didn't like her. Um, so one day she gets into her car and it blows up and she's killed. And they're like, what, what happened? So they kind of reckon it was it was they reckon it was the LVF. They have a person they think it was. They think it was this guy by the name of Jimmy Fulton. Um, so they didn't have much else. They also couldn't really. They were like, look, the RUC have a bad. Rep- the reputation here is a bit complicated because of this collusion thing. So we need someone outside to look into this to see if we can figure out how to get her. I'm sorry, how to find out who, who, who was the person who planted the bomb. So the eyes are on Jimmy. Jimmy ends up over in the USA, maybe hiding out. Um, and then there was an instance where he's found in a house with a bunch of ammunition and like an RPG and everything. And they're like, what? Like, how, why are you here? So instead of facing any charges, he's sent back to Northern Ireland. And then out of the blue, Jimmy gets a call from his friend, um, Muriel, Muriel Gibson, who says, Jimmy, you know, I, I met a woman over here. She's very interesting. Her husband is kind of part of a group that are looking for a driver. You know, do you want to just get out of Northern Ireland and get a fresh start? So Jimmy was like, yeah, I think I need this. So he went over to uh, the south of England um, and he became a member of like the firm, which is kind of a loose word for like this gang in a way. Mm-hmm. So he was the driver for Neil. Neil was the boss of the gang. And then for two years, Jimmy would drive drive Neil around, uh, bring him to, they do jobs. They had an art heist. They'd steal cigarettes and they'd steal all this sort of stuff. Um. And then at the end of two years, bang, the police descend upon Jimmy. They arrest him. They fly him back to Northern Ireland. And he was like, you got no, why are you, why are you arresting me? I've just been doing nothing. And they're like, Jimmy, every single person you've talked to for the past two years is a police officer. All of your friends, <laughs> all oh of the, every heist, every gang member you met mm. was one of the most intricate, massive undercover operations. Mm. And it was the the mouse trap was set and they just needed him to walk into it mm. and he did so yeah I, I don't really want to give away the outcome but they didn't they didn't get him for killing rosemary nelson but he won't be coming out of prison anytime soon mm-hmm. okay That's yeah the there, there's it, some so. fascinating stories um yeah, yeah uh, 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 so i'll be keep i keep listening and uh uh the troubles podcast uh Take, go back to the start. Just start listening one at a time, and and you'll you'll be hooked. A lot of people have done it. Have, have started listening after I recommend it to come back. And they're like, "Oh my god, it's freaking fascinating!" Uh, the, the, it's just it's a very misunderstood kind of story because, like we said earlier, it's so complex. But um, I, I appreciate you being on the podcast. That was awesome. I'd like to follow up again, maybe in in a couple of months, and and, and do another one because I know people yeah. are gonna want it. I feel um, like we could talk for the two hours. Like as oh, we were talking, easy. there was just more. Easy. Like, oh yeah, yeah the easy. early days of republicanism in the Republic. Like some of the yeah, the, bombing, the, the people who went to prison in England for doing mm-hmm. nothing just because it, it was yeah. a real sense it's of Guildford anger. Four and yeah, Guilford Four, yeah. And Maguire Seven. Mm-hmm. The yeah, it, the yeah, Lockall ambush, shoot to kill, and everything. Yeah, that did, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that uh, oh. there was so much. There there, there really was. Um, the tie in with the Irish Army. Um, and I don't know way, about yeah, very, very I know, yeah, yeah. We, we'll talk about that.